Hey there, welcome back to Story Slices, where we slice through the best Reddit tales just for you. Let's dive right into the first story. The first one is the title story, and it starts like this. Living by the lake had always been my dream. The tranquil waters, the rustling trees, the gentle lapping of waves against the shore, it was paradise. When I finally saved up enough to buy a modest lakefront property, I thought I'd found my slice of heaven. Little did I know that my neighbor Karen would turn it into a living nightmare. I'm John, a 35-year-old software developer who'd been grinding away in the city for years. After a particularly stressful project wrapped up, I decided it was time for a change. I'd always loved nature, and the idea of waking up to a lakeside view every morning was too tempting to pass up. So, I cashed in my savings, took out a mortgage, and bought a small but charming cabin on Lake Serenity. The first few months were blissful. I set up a home office overlooking the water, started kayaking on weekends, and even took up fishing. My stress levels plummeted, and I felt healthier than I had in years. The neighbors Samuda friendly enough, mostly retirees and a few families who use their properties as vacation homes. Then I met Karen. Karen lived in the McMansion next door, a gaudy monstrosity that stuck out like a sore thumb among the more modest cabins. She was in her late 40s, with a blonde bob haircut and a permanent scowl etched on her face. From day one, it was clear she wasn't thrilled about having a new neighbor. You know, this used to be such a quiet community, she said one day as I was mowing my lawn. I hope you're not planning on having loud parties or anything like that. I assured her I was just looking for peace and quiet, but that didn't seem to satisfy her. Over the next few weeks, I caught her watching me from her windows, taking notes when I had friends over, and even measuring the distance between our properties with a tape measure. Things came to a head when I decided to build a small dock. I'd gotten all the necessary permits and was excited to have a place to tie up a future boat. The morning the construction was set to begin, I woke up to the sound of Karen's shrill voice outside my window. Excuse me, what do you think you're doing? I stumbled out of bed and onto my porch, rubbing sleep from my eyes. Karen was standing at the edge of my property, hands on her hips, glaring at me and the two confused-looking construction workers. Good morning, Karen, I said, trying to keep my voice calm. Is something wrong? 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 You're about to build an eyesore that will ruin my view. I won't stand for it. I took a deep breath. Karen, I've got all the proper permits. The dock won't extend anywhere near your property line. I'm well within my rights to build it. She huffed and puffed, threatening to call the homeowners association, which, by the way, didn't exist for our lake community. Eventually, she stormed off, but not before warning me that this wasn't over. I shook my head and apologized to the workers. Don't worry about her, I said. Let's get started on that dock. Little did I know, Karen's threat wasn't empty. She was just getting started. For the next few weeks, things were relatively quiet. The dock was built without further incident, and I was enjoying my little slice of paradise more than ever. I even invited some friends over for a small barbecue to celebrate the dock's completion. As we were lounging on the new structure, fishing rods in hand and cold beers at our sides, I noticed Karen pacing back and forth in front of her picture window. She was on the phone, gesticulating wildly and shooting dirty looks our way. Man, what's her problem? My buddy, Mike asked, following my gaze. I shrugged. Who knows? She's been like that since I moved in. I try not to let it bother me. We went back to our fishing and conversation, but I couldn't shake the feeling that Karen was up to something. That nagging sensation in the back of my mind turned out to be right. About a week later, I woke up to the sound of voices outside. Groggy and confused, I stumbled to my window and nearly fell over in shock. There, on my property, were several men in hard hats and reflective vests. They were walking around with clipboards and measuring equipment, acting like they owned the place. I threw on some clothes and rushed outside, my heart pounding. Excuse me. I called out. What's going on here? A tall man with a salt and pepper beard turned to me. Good morning, sir. We're just doing some preliminary surveying for the new development. I blinked, sure I had misheard him. I'm sorry, what development? He looked confused. The lakefront expansion project. We're assessing the land for construction. Didn't the owner inform you? I am the owner, I said, my voice rising, and I haven't authorized any construction or surveying on my property. The man's eyebrows shot up. He pulled out a document from his clipboard and showed it to me. According to our records, this land was recently purchased by a Karen Thompson. She hired us to begin preparations for a major landscaping and construction project. My jaw dropped? Karen Thompson. My nightmare neighbor? She had somehow claimed ownership of my land and was trying to take it over. There's been a huge mistake, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I'm the legal owner of this property. I have all the documentation to prove it. Karen Thompson is my neighbor, and she has no right to this land. The surveyor looked uncomfortable. I see. Well, we can't proceed if there's a dispute over ownership. I'll have to contact our client and sort this out. In the meantime, we'll cease all activities here. As the survey team packed up their equipment, I stormed over to Karen's house, my blood boiling. I pounded on her door, not caring if I woke up the whole neighborhood. Karen answered, looking smug in her silk bathrobe. Well, good morning, John. Is something the matter? Cut the crap, Karen, I snapped. What the hell do you think you're doing? Claiming my property is your own? 
She had the audacity to look offended. I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. This lakefront has been in desperate need of improvement, and I'm simply taking steps to beautify the area. By stealing my land? I was practically shouting now. I'll sue you for this, Karen. I swear to God, I'll take you to court and make you regret ever trying this stunt. Her smug expression faltered for a moment, but she quickly recovered. Go ahead and try, John. I have excellent lawyers. You'll find that everything I've done is perfectly legal. With that, she slammed the door in my face. I stood there for a moment, stunned and shaking with rage. Then I pulled out my phone and started making calls. First to my bank, then to a real estate lawyer, and finally to the local police to report attempted property theft. The next few weeks were a whirlwind of legal consultations, paperwork, and sleepless nights. I took time off work to focus on fighting Karen's ridiculous claim. My lawyer, a no-nonsense woman named Sarah, assured me that Karen didn't have a leg to stand on. From what I can see, Sarah said during our first meeting, she's forged documents claiming she purchased your property. It's a clumsy attempt at best. We'll be able to prove the forgery easily. But why would she do this? I asked, still bewildered by the whole situation. Why not just try to buy the land from me if she wanted it so badly? Sarah shrugged. Some people think they're above the law. From what you've told me about her behavior, it sounds like she's used to getting her way and doesn't like being told no. As we prepared our case, Karen's construction project continued to escalate. She hired landscapers to start clearing trees along the property line, inching closer and closer to my land. When I confronted them, they claimed they had permits, all in Karen's name of course. I called the police again, and they came out to stop the work. But Karen always seemed to be one step ahead, producing more forged documents or finding loopholes to continue her encroachment. The situation was taking a toll on me. I couldn't sleep, couldn't concentrate on work, and found myself jumping at every sound outside, worried it was Karen's goons coming to bulldoze my house while I slept. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, our court date arrived. I put on my best suit, gathered all my documentation, and headed to the courthouse with Sarah. As we walked in, I saw Karen surrounded by a team of slick-looking lawyers. She shot me a smirk that made my blood boil. The judge, a stern-looking woman in her 60s, called the court to order. Karen's lead attorney stood up first, presenting their case with a smooth, practiced air. Your Honor, my client, Mrs. Thompson, is a pillar of the Lake Serenity community, he began. She's lived here for over two decades and has always had the best interests of her neighbors at heart. When the opportunity arose to purchase this additional lakefront property and develop it for the benefit of all residents, she jumped at the chance. I clenched my fists under the table as he continued, spinning a web of lies about how Karen had legitimately purchased my land and how I was the one trying to interfere with rightful development. When it was our turn, Sarah stood up, her posture radiating confidence. Your Honor, the plaintiff's entire case is built on lies and forged documents. We have irrefutable proof that my client, John Anderson, is the legal and rightful owner of the property in question. She proceeded to methodically dismantle Karen's claims, presenting my original deed, bank statements showing my mortgage payments, and even testimony from the previous owner confirming he had sold the property to me, not Karen. As Sarah spoke, I watched Karen's smug expression slowly crumble. Her lawyers huddled together, whispering frantically. I allowed myself to feel a glimmer of hope. The judge listened intently, asking pointed questions to both sides. Finally, she called for a brief recess to review all the evidence. Those were the longest 30 minutes of my life. When we returned to the courtroom, the judge's expression was severe. After careful consideration of the evidence presented, I find in favor of the defendant, John Anderson. The plaintiff's claim to the property is baseless and founded on clearly forged documents. I let out a breath I didn't realize I'd been holding. Sarah squeezed my arm in congratulations. But the judge wasn't finished. Furthermore, given the serious nature of these forgeries and the harassment Mr. Anderson has endured, I am referring this case to the district attorney's office for potential criminal charges against Mrs. Thompson. Karen's face went pale. She started to protest, but her lawyer wisely clamped a hand on her arm to silence her. Mrs. Thompson, the judge continued, her voice sharp, you are hereby ordered to cease all activities on Mr. Anderson's property immediately. You are to remove any equipment or personnel you have placed there within 24 hours. Failure to comply will result in additional legal consequences. With a bang of her gavel, it was over. I had one. As we left the courthouse, I felt like I was walking on air. Sarah was grinning from ear to ear. Congratulations, John. Justice prevailed today. I thanked her profusely, still somewhat in shock that it was finally over. As we descended the courthouse steps, I saw Karen being led away in handcuffs, screeching about how this was all a mistake and she'd have everyone's jobs. The aftermath of the trial was swift. Karen was charged with multiple counts of forgery, attempted grand theft, and harassment. Her construction company turned out to be a group of cronies she'd hired to pose as legitimate workers. They quickly turned on her to save their own skins, providing even more evidence of her schemes. In the end, 
Karen was sentenced to five years in prison and ordered to pay substantial damages to me for the stress and financial hardship her actions had caused. Her husband, who claimed to have known nothing about her plans, filed for divorce while she was awaiting sentencing. As for me, life slowly returned to normal. The lake was peaceful once again, and I could finally enjoy my property without constant fear and stress. I used some of the settlement money to build a proper boathouse, something I'd always dreamed of but couldn't afford before. One sunny afternoon, about a month after the trial, I was out on my dock, fishing rod in hand, when I heard a voice call out, Excuse me, are you John? I turned to see an older couple standing at the edge of my property. They looked nervous. Yes, that's me, I replied, reeling in my line and walking over to greet them. The man stepped forward, extending his hand. I'm Bill Thompson, Karen's ex-husband. This is my sister, Laura. We? We wanted to apologize for everything Karen put you through. I shook his hand, surprised. That's very kind of you, but you don't need to apologize for her actions. Laura spoke up, her voice trembling slightly. We do though. We enabled her behavior for years, always making excuses. If we'd confronted her sooner, maybe things wouldn't have gone this far. I invited them onto the dock, and we spent the next hour talking. They shared stories of Karen's escalating entitlement over the years, how she'd alienated friends and family with her demands and schemes. Bill had finally reached his breaking point with this latest fiasco. I'm selling the house, he said, gazing out over the lake. Too many bad memories. I hope whoever buys it will be a better neighbor to you than we were. As they were leaving, Bill turned back to me. You know, Karen always hated that you seemed so content with your little cabin. I think she couldn't stand seeing someone happy with less. I nodded, understanding dawning. It's not about how much you have, it's about appreciating what you've got. After they left, I sat on my dock for a long time, watching the sun set over the lake. I felt a profound sense of gratitude wash over me. Despite all the stress and drama, I still had my little piece of paradise. And now, I could truly enjoy it in peace. The next weekend, I invited all my friends over for a huge lakeside barbecue. As we lounged on the dock, beers in hand and laughter filling the air, I couldn't help but smile. This was what lakeside living was all about. Good company, beautiful surroundings, and not a Karen in sight. Life by the lake was good again. Better than ever actually, and as I looked out over the tranquil waters, I knew I'd never take this piece for granted again. Update, update. It's been about a year since the whole Karen fiasco, and I've gotta say, life by the lake has been pretty sweet. After all the drama died down, I finally got to enjoy my little slice of paradise the way I'd always imagined. The first few months after the trial were a bit weird I'll admit. I kept expecting to wake up to the sound of bulldozers, or see Karen's face pressed against my window. But as time passed, I started to relax. The nightmares about losing my home faded, and I could actually sit on my dock without constantly looking over my shoulder. Bill, Karen's ex-husband, made good on his word and sold their McMansion. The new owners are a retired couple named Tom and Linda. They're quiet, friendly, and best of all, they seem to actually like the lake for what it is. No grand plans for improving the neighborhood or trying to turn it into some exclusive resort. One Saturday morning, as I was having my coffee on the porch, Tom wandered over with a six-pack of beer. Morning John, he called out. Thought you might want to join me for a little fishing. That is, if you're not sick of the lake yet. I laughed. Tom, I don't think I'll ever get sick of this view. Let me grab my rod. As we sat on my dock, lines in the water, Tom cleared his throat. You know, Linda and I heard about what happened with the previous owner. Must have been hell for you. I nodded, taking a swig of beer. It was pretty rough for a while there. But honestly, I think it made me appreciate this place even more. Tom smiled. Well, you ever need anything, you just holler. Linda and I, we believe in being good neighbors. That conversation with Tom got me thinking. Throughout the whole ordeal with Karen, I'd been so focused on protecting what was mine that I'd kind of isolated myself from the rest of the lake community. Maybe it was time to change that. So, I decided to throw a little lakeside barbecue. Nothing fancy, just burgers, beers, and good company. I invited Tom and Linda, of course, along with a few other neighbors I'd gotten to know over the past year. As I was setting up the grill, I heard a car pull up. To my surprise, it was Sarah, my lawyer from the Karen case. Hope you don't mind me crashing the party, she said with a grin. I was in the area and thought I'd check in on my favorite client. Sarah, Sarah, great to see you, I said, genuinely happy to see her. Grab a beer and make yourself at home. As the afternoon wore on, the deck was filled with the sound of laughter and conversation. I found myself relaxing in a way I hadn't in a long time. These people weren't just neighbors anymore, they were becoming friends. Later, as the sun was setting, Sarah pulled me aside. John, there's actually another reason I stopped by. I've got some news about Karen. My stomach did a little flip. Oh, what's up? Sarah's expression was serious. She's trying to appeal her conviction. Her new lawyer is arguing that she was mentally unfit during the original trial and is pushing for a competency hearing. I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. Are you kidding me? After everything she did? 
Sarah held up a hand. Don't worry, it's a long shot. The evidence against her is overwhelming, and her behavior during and after the trial doesn't support claims of mental incompetence. I just wanted to give you a heads up in case you hear anything. I nodded, trying to process this new information. Thanks Sarah. I appreciate you letting me know. She squeezed my arm. We beat her once John. If we need to, we'll do it again. As Sarah walked away to mingle with the other guests, I stood there for a moment, staring out at the lake. The peaceful scene in front of me contrasted sharply with the turmoil in my mind. Tom must have noticed something was off because he wandered over, another beer in hand. Everything okay John? You look like you've seen a ghost. I sighed, accepting the beer. Just got some news about Karen. She's trying to appeal her conviction. Tom's eyebrows shut up. Seriously? That woman doesn't know when to quit, does she? Apparently not, I said, taking a long swig of beer. Tom was quiet for a moment, then said, You know, my dad used to say that some people are like bad pennies. They just keep turning up. But he also said that doesn't mean you have to let them tarnish your shine. I couldn't help but laugh. Your dad sounds like a wise man, Tom. He grinned. He had his moments. Point is, don't let this news ruin your night. You've got friends here, good food, and a view that most people would kill for. Focus on that. As I looked around at the smiling faces of my neighbors and friends, I realized Tom was right. Karen had already taken up too much of my time and energy. I wasn't going to let her ruin one more day. The next morning, I called Sarah to get more details about Karen's appeal. She explained that while Karen's lawyer had filed the motion, it was unlikely to go anywhere. The judge who handled your case has already reviewed the motion, Sarah said. She's not buying the mental incompetence angle. Karen was perfectly lucid during the trial and in all her dealings before that. This is just a desperate attempt to avoid consequences. I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. So what happens now? The judge will likely deny the motion for a competency hearing, Sarah explained. If that happens, Karen's options are pretty limited. She could try to appeal to a higher court, but given the strength of the evidence against her, I don't see that going anywhere. After hanging up with Sarah, I decided to take my kayak out on the lake. As I paddled, I thought about everything that had happened over the past year. The stress, the fear, the uncertainty, it had all been real. But so was this moment, gliding across the calm water, surrounded by nature. I realized that I had a choice. I could let the fear of what Karen might do next control my life, or I could choose to live fully, enjoying every moment in this place I'd fought so hard to keep. The choice was clear. Over the next few months, I threw myself into lake life with a new enthusiasm. I joined the local conservation group that worked to keep the lake clean and protect the wildlife. I started hosting regular game nights at my place, inviting neighbors and making new friends. One weekend, I even organized a lake-wide cleanup day. To my surprise, almost everyone showed up, armed with trash bags and eager to help. As we worked, picking up litter from the shoreline and even diving to retrieve sunken junk, I felt a sense of community I'd never experienced before. It was during this cleanup that I met Elena, a marine biologist who'd recently moved to the area to study the lake's ecosystem. We hit it off immediately, bonding over our love for the water and our shared belief in preserving natural spaces. As spring turned to summer, Elena and I started spending more time together. We'd go on kayaking trips, exploring the far reaches of the lake. She taught me about the various fish species and the delicate balance of the lake's ecosystem. I found myself falling for her, not just because of her intelligence and beauty, but because she saw the lake the same way I did, as something precious to be protected. It was on one of these kayaking trips that I got the call from Sarah. Elena and I had just pulled our kayaks onto a small secluded beach for a picnic lunch when my phone rang. John, Sarah said, her voice excited. I've got great news. The judge not only denied Karen's motion for a competency hearing, but she also issued a strongly worded statement condemning the attempt to manipulate the justice system. I let out a whoop of joy, startling a nearby flock of ducks. That's fantastic, Sarah. So it's really over? As over as it can be, Sarah confirmed. Karen's lawyer tried to argue that the stress of the trial had affected her mental state, but the judge wasn't having it. She pointed out that Karen's actions before, during, and after the trial all demonstrated a clear, calculating mind. The judge even suggested that this frivolous appeal might be grounds for additional sanctions. After I hung up, I turned to Elena, who was looking at me with a mixture of curiosity and concern. Everything okay? She asked. I filled her in on the Karen saga, something I'd been hesitant to do earlier in our relationship. To my relief, Elena listened without judgment, her eyes widening at some of the more outrageous parts of the story. When I finished, she was quiet for a moment. Then she said, Wow John, I had no idea you'd been through all that. It must have been terrible. I nodded, looking out over the lake. It was rough, I won't lie. There were times I thought about just giving up, selling the place and moving back to the city. Elena reached out and took my hand. I'm glad you didn't. Not just because I wouldn't have met you, but because this place, this lake, it needs people who care about it, people who'll fight for it. Her words hit home. I realized that in standing up to Karen, I hadn't just been fighting for my property. I'd been fighting for this whole ecosystem, for the right of a place like this to exist without being exploited or destroyed. As we paddled back home that evening, 
the setting sun turning the lake into a mirror of gold and crimson, I felt a deep sense of peace. Karen and her scheme seemed like a distant memory now, a storm that had passed leaving the air clearer in its wake. Back at my cabin, Elena and I sat on the dock, feet dangling in the cool water. So, she said, bumping her shoulder against mine, now that you're not in danger of having your land stolen out from under you, what's next? I grinned, putting my arm around her. Well, I've been thinking about that. How would you feel about helping me set up a little education center here? Nothing big, just a place where kids can come learn about the lake, the wildlife, why, it's important to protect places like this. Elena's eyes lit up. John, that's a fantastic idea. I could help develop the curriculum, maybe even run some workshops. As we sat there, excitedly planning our new project, I looked out over the lake, my lake. I thought about how close I'd come to losing all this, and how fighting to keep it had led me to this moment. Karen had tried to take my land, but in the end she'd given me something far more valuable. She'd shown me what I was willing to fight for, and in doing so, had helped me build a life richer than I could have imagined. The lake shimmered in the fading light, full of promise and possibility. Whatever challenges came next, I knew I was ready to face them. After all, I had the strength of the lake behind me, and now, I had Elena by my side too. Life was good. Really, really good. Are you hungry for more slices of stories? Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell to never miss out on any videos. See you tomorrow at Story Slices.